Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Um, today, we're going to be looking at uh, an introduction to the Echo Wi-Fi design tools. Before I pass you over to Nick, um, I'd just like to say that everybody's in listen-only mode. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So first of all, I'd just like to give a really quick introduction to uh, who Open Reality are for anybody that's not aware. So we've been uh, network monitoring and performance specialists for almost 20 years now. And for 10 of those, we've been Echohow's UK distributor. So we've got a, a long history working with Echohow um, and a very, um, very good one. Um, we've recently had a bit of an expansion to our wireless portfolio. Some of you might be aware that we've uh, we've taken on three new vendors, one being Hive Radar, who do um, AP on a stick survey kits. We've also got Mojo Networks, who have recently been acquired by Arista, who do uh, access points, and also 7Signal, who do a Wi-Fi monitoring solution. So without further ado, I'd like to pass you over to Nick Turner, who's the um, technical uh, lead for ECHO in the, the UK and EMEA. Um, thanks for joining us today, Nick. Hello, yes, how's it going? Very it well. It is a pleasure to join you. Okay, uh, hello everybody, welcome to the webinar. Uh, I am hosting today from a beautiful hotel in Spain. So, you know, hope the background here is not, not too, uh, too ugly. Uh, and uh, so I should introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nick Turner. I have worked for Echo now for two years. Uh, I was a wireless, uh, a Wi-Fi engineer, uh, and I worked for a few value-added resellers in the UK. Uh, and I was a customer of Echo House, so I was using their tool before I joined the company. So let's talk about what Echo How actually does and what, what this company is all about. <clears throat> and I'm gonna do my best here not to read the slides. So if, uh, I'm not gonna read them point, you know, word for word here. Uh, so that by that, I mean, you're gonna have to read the slides yourself uh, if you wanna gain the full value of the slide, or you can listen to my uh, debriefed version. But basically, Echo How is a Wi-Fi suite of tools, a Wi-Fi tool provider, and they have a suite of design tools. And uh, Echo House started in the year 2000, and I think we have a slide on that as well. Okay, here we go. If we do this, <laughs> okay, there we go. So I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna get my description here in the wrong order from the uh, from the slides, but that's absolutely fine. So Echo started in the year 2000, and they were a spin-off from Helsinki University. And so even today, our European headquarters is in Helsinki, Finland, and that's where the research and development offices are now held. Our headquarters is in Reston, Virginia, and we also have a sales office in Singapore. The rest, of, the rest of the dots on our map are partners who we work with very closely in the individual markets, because as I'm sure you can appreciate, uh, especially throughout Europe and Asia, there are lots of different languages that are spoken. And so how ourselves, which we're a relatively small company, we, we don't have personnel who speak all of these different languages. So we have a, a broad network of partners throughout the world. Um, and also because partners do a much better job of interacting with the customers than necessarily the, the tool vendor does in every single market, okay? So hence why we have these strong relationships with partners such as Open Reality. Okay. Come on. Let's, okay. So we've got a slide here that states that so the world's biggest brands use Echohow, and uh, this is true. We have lots of big vendors who use Echohow for their Wi-Fi design or Wi-Fi survey needs. <clears throat> and I think the thing really here about the, with the Wi-Fi vendors is that Echohow is a vendor neutral tool. We, we don't have any preference for a specific brand of wireless vendor, but we do have 
strong relationships with the big ones. Um, so for example, Cisco and Aruba and Ruckus, we have good relationships with their uh, engineering teams and there is a little bit of cross-pollination. So when we, uh, when Cisco, for example, have a new access point coming up, they will share those antenna radiation patterns with us before the hardware is launched so that those tools are in the planning in the planning section of Ekahau in preparation for the hardware release. But as we know, Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. And so we try to be, well, we are vendor neutral. We, we, we embrace all brands of Wi-Fi. So what is happening with Wi-Fi networks? Uh, this is a nice, nice slide just talking about the different eras of Wi-Fi. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skim on past this one just to say that if you're on this webinar, you are probably connected to the Wi-Fi right now. And it is becoming increasingly important that you have a solid connection to the internet. Not all of the time, but most of the time. And especially if you're trying to do certain tasks. So for example, I'm in a hotel right now and I'm relying on the Wi-Fi provided by the hotel to do this webinar. Uh, there are, I guess there are a few other options. I could maybe find another venue to host it, but then there are all sorts of considerations to be considered to uh, take and take on board there. Uh, you guys already know this, you know, and especially when you are going to areas where you know you won't have Wi-Fi, then you start to think think ahead saying, oh, well, I'm going to go for a certain period of time without an internet connection. So maybe I should get some content downloaded and prepare myself for that time where I'm not contactable and all of this stuff. So basically, Wi-Fi is critical. And good Wi-Fi is very important. And also, it's very easy to make bad Wi-Fi, right? Uh, so good Wi-Fi. And when, when we describe good Wi-Fi, what really is good Wi-Fi? I would describe good Wi-Fi as the Wi-Fi that works and is seamless to you as the user of that Wi-Fi. And hotel Wi-Fi is typically not easy to use, I find, uh, when you've got captive portals and there are not, so there are not like necessarily the, there's no standard way to connect to hotel Wi-Fi. You know, everybody does it differently. Sometimes you have to get a code from reception and then that code's only valid for one device or, uh, so that's what happened to me. Actually, I joined, uh, joined with one device and then I joined with the laptop, I joined with the phone and then I joined with a laptop about an hour later and it, I kicked my phone off the Wi-Fi craziness. So that's not necessarily bad Wi-Fi, but it's still a consideration when you're trying to is trying to provide this experience. And I'm definitely not fantastic. I'm not I'm not great at designing user experience, but I know when an experience sucks. Uh, I'm quite happy to talk about uh, I'm quite vocal about when a, when an experience is poor and how it could be improved. And so trying to create these design so you know trying to create this good user experience for a customer on the wi-fi is really important and we uh echo doesn't really talk doesn't as a product doesn't focus in on the uh, captive portal or the authentication methods that are used for your wi-fi but in terms of the design from an rf side of things if you're thinking about good design and wi-fi then echo has the tools for you uh, so that suite of Wi-Fi tools that I was talking about, Ekahau has uh, Wi-Fi planning where everything is virtual and simulated. We have Wi-Fi survey. That's when we collect real world Wi-Fi data from the environment that we are hoping to provide that good experience. And we have reporting the ability to take that data that you've collected or generated in a simulation and turn it into a digestible report document, probably in a Word document or maybe in a PDF that you can then hand over and to, to maybe someone who does not have it, how installed, or it can be shared with VPs and stakeholders of these various Wi-Fi projects. <clears throat> so what do we need from a Wi-Fi design tool? And I'll bring all of these up. 
So natural, I think, think this one's fairly self, fairly, fairly self-explanatory in the first one. Uh, a Wi-Fi design tool has got to be suitable if uh, you can generate heat maps for a Wi-Fi project using Photoshop, but that's not a suitable tool for the job because Photoshop doesn't know anything about Wi-Fi. You need to have a suitable tool for your job, which means having a Wi-Fi focused toolkit, but also it's got to be an appropriate grade. So there are there are free tools, and I think maybe very small Wi-Fi projects, you can actually get away with the free tools sometimes. Although as soon as you start to get into the larger, more enterprise environment, or if you are a network owner of a very large uh, campus, is a campus network, you're going to need a tool that can scale to your project. Okay, free tools are free because they have limited functionality. Well, what else have we got here? Purpose built for planning, planning, planning surveys, analysis, report, troubleshooting, and reporting. A quick thing on troubleshooting. Actually, uh, people often ask me about Echo How and say, so you know, so you're a Wi-Fi troubleshooting tool, aren't you? And uh, I say, well, mm, yeah, we. Uh, you can use Ekahau for troubleshooting, but in the in the in one sense of the word, no, Ekahau is not a troubleshooting tool. But if you understand Wi-Fi and you understand what your requirements are, I think that's the really key thing here. Uh, if you understand what you need from your environment, Ekahau is absolutely a troubleshooting tool because Ekahau will be able to tell you, will be able to measure what you have, compare that against what you tell the software that you need, and then voila, you have a troubleshooting tool. Uh, but out of the box, Ekahau is not going to tell you what's wrong with your network because you need to tell the software what you need from your environments. That's the first, okay? Um, the tool's got to be reliable, absolutely. Fast. Auto planning features using multiple adapters to gather live information. I think that's that's more talking about survey here. And we'll we'll talk about survey when I when I bring up the actual live demo. Easy to learn. This is a point that I can speak to. When I was a, a Wi-Fi engineer, actually designing and deploying wireless networks. Uh, now, you have to take what I'm about to say with a slight pinch of salt, because Ekahau now pay me money to say nice things about their solution, right? But um, genuinely, as a Wi-Fi engineer, when I was using Ekahau, I found the experience to be good. I was able to collect the data that I needed to. The, the tool was reliable, and uh, it didn't it didn't lose data for me. And these are key things about the reliability and easy to learn. Like the UI of Ekahau is just a little bit more friendly, in my opinion. And it's got to fit the budget, of course. And I think that loops back around to our just uh, my comment earlier about free tools being suitable for certain projects. If it's a an enterprise Wi-Fi network that you are designing, then you need an enterprise grade tool. That comes with a larger price tag than the free tool, right? Uh, it's got to fit the budget. So the Ekahal product portfolio. Ekahal Site Survey Pro and 3D Planner. Ekahal the software can do Wi-Fi simulation. This is where everything is virtual. You bring your floor plan into the project, you draw the virtual walls. If you have a CAD file, we can do automatic wall detection. Now we have a virtual environment and we can drop APs either manually or we can use the auto planner to make suggestions based on the coverage requirements that we have, the capacity requirements. We can simulate airtime utilization by saying, well, in this environment, we're going to have 150 laptops. And over here, we're going to have 50 iPhones. And over here, we're going to have 20 uh, barcode scanners. And all of their different air, uh, through data requirements, how much data are each of these devices demanding? And then based on their capabilities, we can Sit, we can simulate the airtime utilization. It's only a simulation though. Uh, and a best case scenario actually as well, because often in the real world, you have neighboring networks which are going to have an impact on your wireless. So there, there is a suite of design tools inside Ekahau, the software. Then there is the survey functionality, 
and survey. Now, quick, a quick, I'll share a quick secret with you guys. Um, I actually don't like the term predictive survey. I don't think that makes any sense. I think people should use the word simulation or predictive design. They're, they're, both, they're both fine, they make perfect sense. But um, predictive survey, I mean, to me, it doesn't, it jars. So if you're doing a simulation or a predictive design, everything's virtual. If you're doing a survey, everything's real world. You've collected data. And for a long time, we used to use Wi-Fi dongles and we would plug one or two external Wi-Fi dongles into our laptops. We would use those then in a passive mode. So just listening to capture the beacons from the APs in our environment. We would walk around the site, clicking on the map where we were, and that would allow us to visualize the Wi-Fi because you guys understand this, Wi-Fi is invisible. You can't see it yet. Uh, we haven't got that sort of augmented reality uh, glasses. So Wi-Fi is invisible and that's what, that's one of the key features that Ekahal can do for us is help us to visualize this data. And you can see there, we're kind of looking at where the Wi-Fi signal strength is good and then where it's hitting the walls and then are we interested in the Wi-Fi outside of the building, that sort of thing. So site surveys, uh, Ekahal can do passive survey, active survey, you can also do throughput surveys. And especially now with the Sidekick, which is a hardware product from Ekahal, we have a high resolution spectrum analyzer, which will allow us to view the raw RF energy in our environments. The key thing that the spectrum analyzer allows us to do is identify non Wi-Fi sources of interference or non Wi-Fi sources of energy, things that are emitting energy, be that intentionally or unintentionally. So an intentional radiator is something like a Bluetooth device or a, <clears throat> or a video transmitter, something that its purpose is to transmit energy, but it may actually use the same part of the spectrum as Wi-Fi, and therefore it's a non-Wi-Fi interferer. Or you may have unintentional transmitters, and that's things like, microwave oven. A microwave oven's job is to make the food inside hot, but it's also emitting energy in the 2.4 gig band. And I don't know why the poor microwave oven gets picked on so much. A, a good high quality microwave oven with a fresh door seal will have fairly low impact on your Wi-Fi, especially if you're on five gigahertz, then it'll have no impact. But what happens or what, what is the typical exam uh, textbook Exam question, textbook example, is the, the cafe in the in, at the workplace where those microwave doors have been open and closed several thousand times and uh, the seals are now wearing. And uh, the Wi-Fi works fine, except when people are on their break because then the microwaves are going on and off, on and off. And that causes uh, additional energy into the environment. And Wi-Fi is not actually magic, all right? It's just Wi-Fi, it's uh, just radio signals being transmitted and received by devices. And so when you have something like a microwave oven, which is very loud and powerful energy source that can overwhelm the signals in that area. I will try and advance this slide. So the Echo House Sidekick, that's what I just talked about, was the, uh, is, a, is a hardware product produced by Echo Helm. It's a small box like this. Uh, it is an almost self-contained uh, sensor unit. Uh, it's not fully self-contained because you still need a laptop at the moment uh, to plug into for a screen. That's the main thing that we're missing on the Sidekick. And that was a, that was a conscious decision. We could have stuck a screen on it that you could fit a screen just in that area there, but it would have been it, that would that would be super ugly. Uh, so Sidekick is this uh, this unit and inside that you've got two wi-fi radios for doing the passive site survey you have a high resolution spectrum analyzer you have a battery you have a battery pack and on the side you have a, a power jack you have a usb kit port by the way that usb port can only be used for data so the sidekick does not draw any power from your laptop ever it only transmits data down that USB cable. Uh, there we go. 
there are actually some other things inside the sidekick as well but the core feet the core things that we're interested in are battery pack two wi-fi radios high resolution spectrum analyzer and it will come with actually I, I, i'd have to get back a slide to show you that i'm not going to do that it comes with a uh a shoulder strap and so you can carry how you carry the sidekick is totally up to you you can um I don't recommend you put it in a bag because the spectrum card inside the side it does get warm that's what that metal grill on the side is that's a heat sink so the um but how you carry it is up to you we include a we can include a shoulder strap but on the back of the sidekick like this one here on the back of the sidekick uh there are several different options in how you could carry this device so i know that there is a, a mounting plate there's also a standard camera screw hole here so there are several solutions out there for dslr cameras which make carrying a device like this easier uh, sidekick weighs just over one kilogram and one thing i find is that people pick it up and they go oh gosh this is a little bit heavy isn't it uh, and yeah, it is. When you when you when you pick it up at an arm's length, yeah, it it has a little bit of weight to it. But when you put it over your shoulder, that weight disappears very quickly. And the key advantage I would say here is that because the Sidekick has got its own battery, it's not drawing any power from your laptop, and that should significantly increase the laptop battery life that you get whilst performing a survey. So the other Ekahau uh, products that you can see now on the screen, uh, there is an Android app. <clears throat> That's all I'm going to say about the Android app for the moment. Uh, it's a Wi-Fi sniffing tool. Uh, we have the Spectrum Analyzer. So actually, what you can see in that screen is the Met. It's a well, it's called the Echo Spectrum Analyzer, but it's also the same piece of hardware as the uh, MetaGeek uh, DBX, and that is a USB form factor Spectrum Analyzer. The uh, that that is the historical Spectrum Analyzer that we have, and Currently, if you were to purchase Ekahau but not interested, and you were not interested in the Sidekick, then we would provide one or two of the USB survey adapters. And why do we use external dongles? Why would we use Sidekick for collecting this data? It's all about consistency of your data collection. If you have a team of people, you definitely want to be all using the same hardware for data collection so that you can compare those results if i do a survey with my macbook pro and my colleague is using a i'm using a 13 inch macbook and my colleague's using a 17 inch dell uh, just the physical size of the antenna inside those two laptops will be different and therefore there will be huge variation in the data that we collect if we were using the onboard NIC. And there are several reasons why we don't want to use the onboard NIC. Uh, another thing is also speed of scanning. So when we're doing a passive survey, we, we spend a little bit of time on each channel and then we start again. So we go like channel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like this. And then all the same on the five gig channels, we zip through all the five gig channels. And uh, by having two Wi-Fi NICs, to sweep through those channels, we can collect twice as much data in the same period of time. And the more data we collect, the more accurate those visualizations will be. So this slide shows you which stage of the Wi-Fi design, which, uh, which stage of the Wi-Fi life cycle you would be using each of these products for. Uh, you would use the planner inside the software for the planning stage, then for validation, you would use the sidekick. Also, you could use the sidekick for troubleshooting as well. Uh, and so, Ekahal product demo. Here we go. This is the bit that I've been looking forward to. So, Sam, if you could put the control over to me, and I will then thank you I very will pass much. You power. I have it, and now I will share my screen, and hopefully, you can see my screen now and let me see if i can hide hide the picture of me people can see you excellent we'll keep that up and close that one off so this is what a like house site survey looks like on the mac it looks pretty much identical on windows uh, we don't. There, there are not two different ver, two, two different licenses for account if you have an account license you can use that on windows or mac 
up to you. And depending on how you license your copy of Echo, you can actually move between the two operating systems. Uh, there are certain restrictions on that, but basically if you have a side gig, you can bind your Echo license to that side gig, and that would allow you to use Echo on Windows or Mac, just depending on which whichever device you plug that side gig into. So I want to show you some of the core basics uh, in this uh, in this tool. Uh, very brief, uh, quick look at the UI. Uh, we've got our menu bar, and then we've got our tool bar below that. This area of the screen is called the mini display views, and it's all about giving you heads up information. So you can see at the moment that it's saying no adapter is available for active survey, but you can see that there is some information coming in. And that's because I'm running on a Mac and I don't have the sidekick switched on. I've just switched the sidekick on. And when that device has booted and is recognized, we'll see this change. And the point here is just that this part of the screen is not there for analysis. It's there for as a heads up display to tell you information about the hardware that's connected. So what you can see here is that now sidekick is connected. There are signals being received in both the 2.4 and 5 gig bands. Is a tiny little preview of the spectrum. This is all here to just reassure me that, yep, my hardware is connected and data is being received. And now we can see that the active survey has been disabled. As we come down the page now, this is called the visualization selector. It's how I control whichever aspect of Wi Fi I am visualizing in the map view or canvas down here. And then there are two tabs planning and survey. Under survey, you have the survey tools under planning. That's right, you have the planning tools. If you're unsure, if you're ever unsure about what a tool does, you hover the mouse over it and then that tooltip window will pop up and tell you all about the tool. And you can disable the tooltips if you want to. Sometimes I find it necessary to switch that off, but sometimes it's useful to have it on also. This is our canvas, the map view down there in the bottom right, we have the legend. If you like pretty colors, you can change the color scheme. I joke about the color scheme and pretty colors. Uh, you're trying to use this tool to visualize data. So whatever color scheme helps you explain to the stakeholders of a Wi-Fi project, or if you are the network owner, it, whatever color scheme helps you understand the data, go with it. That, that's my, my opinion. I really have no problem with people using colorful uh, with beautiful colors on the color schemes. Uh, and on the left-hand side of the page, left and high, left hand side of the screen, we have a collapsible window panel. And there are three tabs, access points, surveys, and building. The building tab is only used for simulation projects, and that's for simulating multiple floor environments. The surveys tab is only used for survey projects. And the access points tab is used for both. If you're doing a simulation project, you will see the virtual APs in a list. If you're doing a if you are doing a survey project, then you would see the detected APs appearing in a list on the left hand side. So let's add a map to this project. Let's get a map in, in, into here. Now I'm going to bring in a, a flat image file first. Uh, the types of files that we support are JPEG, bitmap, GIF, PNG, SVG, PDF, they are flat image files. And what I mean by that is that there are, there are typically no, there is no layer information available, which means that we have to draw the walls manually. Now the process of doing that is not too difficult, but it does take time. <clears throat> the alternative is using a layered image format, such a uh, layered, image format no that's not really the, the right word but a cad file dwg or dxf uh, contains layer information and we can use that information to speed up the wall drawing process but what i will show you here is here's my floor plan i've brought it in and now i need to set the scale to set the scale we can hide that window panel on the left we come along my toolbar to the scale tool and now i need to click and drag a known distance on my map. I happen to know that this corridor is 29 meters in length. So we do that, press enter, and now the scale has been set. And by setting the scale, now Echo can simulate what Wi-Fi coverage would look like in free space. Because 
the the rate at which Wi-Fi signals attenuate through free space is a consistent value. In order to visualize that in our project, we need to know the scale of the map. So setting the scale is critical to having a successful Wi-Fi project. When you're setting the scale of a map, I don't recommend using a doorway. Sometimes you don't have any other choice, but if you can possibly avoid using doorways to scale your projects, I recommend it. In fact, I would rather zoom in on this map using Google Earth and setting the scale using this dimension than using a doorway. You Quick note here, you do need to have a floor plan if you want to do a survey or a predictive design. If you don't have a good floor plan, you're going to have a very tough time coming up with a with an accurate uh, survey or simulation. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't go ahead with the project. Maybe you just need to spend some time creating a floor plan. I've created many floor plans in, in my time. Uh, you may need to use Google Earth again, zoom in on the area that is important and take a screen grab and then manipulate that floor plan using an image editor, uh, draw some black lines to mark out the areas that are important to you. Or if you need floor plans of inside a building, perhaps you may be able to hunt down a fire escape plan and take a picture of that. That would work. Honestly, anything is better than nothing because if you don't have anything, you cannot do your survey. You cannot do a simulation if you don't have some sort of floor plan. Uh, I have used floor plans that have been drawn within uh, Excel and it's again better than nothing but it's uh, they're often out of scale they're, they're not quite to scale so oh, well they're, they're rarely to scale so that's the problem that you have with uh, using Excel to draw your floor plans. Let's draw some walls. So we'll come along my toolbar to the wall tool. And now you'll see here, up here in the, in the, uh, along the toolbar that there is now some more options. Now what we're looking at here is the default material library. So we have a library of wall materials. These are just here to get you going. So for example, if we said that the exterior wall of this building is gonna be a concrete wall. So we you know we would draw a concrete wall around the outskirts of the building. Now. If you, uh, you happen to be an obsessive compulsive, then I imagine you will have a whale of a time uh, drawing these walls. Uh, now, if I was doing this project for real, I would be going, I would be spending much more, I would be paying much more attention to detail. I would be drawing this wall along the wall exactly, because the more accurately we put information into our Ekahal projects, the better the results will be but I'm doing this quickly to just demonstrate what the, uh, what the tool looks like. Uh, and now I'm gonna change my wall material. I'm gonna go to a dry wall, and now I can use this to, to draw some walls like this. So I'm just doing left clicks here. So a left click would start drawing my wall, a left click would add an anchor point, and then I do a right click, and then that releases it. And hopefully what you're getting the idea here is that I need to tell the software about my environment, and then that way we can actually use that data to come up with a prediction of what the Wi-Fi would look like. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna do one more thing here. Now, I'm doing a horrible job of drawing these walls. I've drawn a few walls. It's not super accurate, therefore the results that I produce will not be super accurate. I can now go along that toolbar to the simulated AP tool. And now we have access to the AP library. And as I was saying before, we are friends with all Wi-Fi vendors. And so if, you, if there's an AP or a wireless vendor that we don't have in our tool, then let us know. We will contact that vendor and, and ask them, would you like to put your APs or get your APs added to our tool? Because we will happily add them for you. We just need, you, we just need to share the, yeah, the vendor just needs to share the uh, antenna patterns with us. So let's go with, let's go with the Mojo AP. Now, Sam, you, you on the line? What's, what's your favorite uh, Mojo AP? 
Let's go with the 120. We'll go with the 120? Alrighty. So we're going to go with a Mojo 120, and uh, I can do a left click, and that will drop that AP into my simulated environment. Now, does is that accurately representing what would happen? In this part of the map, I think it's doing a fairly good job because I did draw the walls. But over here, I haven't drawn those walls. And therefore, we're seeing what would happen with this AP in free space over in this area. So rather than me show you what would happen with a poorly drawn map, let's bring a CAD file into this project. And then we can see what an accurate simulation would look like. And I can't stress how important quality CAD files are, they're, they're super important. Uh, this demonstration CAD file is of course well suited for demonstrating this point. But you see, when I try to import a CAD file into my Ekahal project, you will see that the a, a different window appears and it will allow me to look at that CAD file, but with respect to all of the layers that are held within that CAD file. So I'm going to do this bit nice and quickly. Uh, this is the model view. This is the print view. These are settings that are contained within individual CAD files. And I have the ability now to select different layers. So for example, there's a layer here called doors, and I can assign one of those virtual wall materials to these doors. And so we're going to say that they're solid wood doors. We've got the exterior walls. They are going to be concrete. We have the stairwells. So I'm going to state that they're also made of concrete. The interior walls, I'm going to make them drywall. And the windows layer, we'll set them to be thick glass. Notice that the scale has been set automatically. And that is another feature of CAD files, that they are scale drawings. So now Ekaha will crunch the numbers and draw those walls for us. Just, just for that uh, yeah, um, for running, it. Nick, I've got a quick question here. So once the floor plan um, data is all set up in Ekaha, can you uh, import that into the Aruba Visual RF? Not at the moment, but there are discussions. We are we are we are in communication with Aruba in 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 a respect similar to that. I'm not sure if it is for Visual RF or if it's with Airwave, but we are definitely open to you know these kind of. Uh, collaboration efforts and uh, I'm pretty sure that we that there are conversation early stage conversations with uh, with Aruba on uh, on, a, on a collaborative on a collaboration note there so if, if something like that was important to you then by all means uh, you can reach out to me uh, and make a suggestion or we even have a, a dedicated email address which is requests at ekahow.com and that's where all feature requests should be directed and so if uh, for example if the integration of ekahow into the aruba platform was very important to you let us know about it through that email address please so you can now see that were there any other questions sam that were uh, particularly relevant at this at this point in time uh, there's a couple more questions, but I think we'll come to those later. Okay, no worries. So uh, I'm going to speed things up a little bit because uh, I want to talk about survey as well. So now you can see all of the walls have been drawn for us automatically. I can go back to that AP tool. Now we're going to actually stick with the Mojo C120. And this time we're going to use a different visualization. We're going to use the coverage planning visualization. And this view gives us a very quick and dirty simulation of the coverage. Currently, we are viewing signal strength in the five gigahertz band with a signal strength threshold of neg 67. And we are basically, we are saying to you, if you drop an AP there, 
you're going to get 5 gigahertz coverage to a threshold of NIC67 that looks something like this. And this coverage planning visualization is all about just quickly getting a rough idea of where you would want to be dropping your APs into the project. Uh, one thing that this visualization is great for is explaining why putting APs in your corridors is not good practice sometimes. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice, and I, I do understand this, but uh, you'll notice that when I put APs in the rooms, their, their coverage area is fairly contained. However, when I put an AP in the corridor, you see how much it spills along the corridor. And so whenever you see, say, four or five APs in a row going down the corridor, you're going to have problems if you're using the 2.4 gig band, because there are only three maybe four, but there are definitely only three uh, non-overlapping channels in the 2.4 gig band. And so if you have a free space area and there are four APs and you're using 2.4 gigahertz, two of those APs are gonna be on the same channel. We can drop that back now to the signal strength visualization. Now we get a much more detailed visualization with contour lines of what our coverage looks like. So it's just to tidy things up and make this look a little bit neater. Uh, if I go to the view option, I can switch the wall layer off. It's still there. The, the, the effects of those virtual walls are still being applied to my visualization, but you're just not seeing them. And for example, if I wanted to tidy this visualization up a little bit, I could use the requirement area tool to, to mark out the areas which are in scope for this project. And so this might require a conversation with the stakeholders to find out what well, do, are we, are the customer, is the customer expecting Wi-Fi in the, in the outside garden areas? And if the answer is no, then I would use the area tool just to mark out the area, the perimeter of the building to just make this clear to everybody that the, the region that is in scope for this project is clearly within this box. And this will also tidy my visualization up. And now we will see that that visualization has been cleaned up. So just to wrap things up quickly, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run the automatic channel planner on, the, on these APs. So that's this tool here. It means I can optimize channels automatically within my virtual environment. And when we talk about Wi-Fi, it's not just about signal strength. We need to also care about things such as signal to noise ratio. What's the minimum supported data rate gonna be? Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the AP redundancy going to be like? What's the number of APs? Uh, how many APs do we want to provide, do we want to be providing coverage with and at what signal strength? This criteria here is all about uh, providing the ability to roam. So a client can roam between APs. So there must always be an, another AP within a certain signal strength threshold for the client to then roam to. Uh, and channel overlap, channel overlap refers to how many APs have you got on the same channel in a given area. And so project coverage requirements, this is what I need for my Wi-Fi to work. And I can then use this visualization that we have hidden in here called network health. And that will give me a pass and fail view of my network design. Remember, this is all virtual, but this is a good visualization for making things simple. It's pass and fail. Over here, we're meeting all of our requirements. And in these areas, we're failing to meet the requirements. And if, if you were going to press me, if you're going to hold my arm behind my back and say, well, where's the troubleshooting in this tool, Nick? Then I would say we would use the network issues visualization. And network issues will visualize the primary criteria that is failing in given areas. And so we can see that there are a few areas where the number of APs on non-overlapping channels is failing. And we can see areas where the signal strength criteria is not being met. So a couple more things just to touch on, but uh, then I'm going to change gears and talk about survey. Uh, we do have the ability to do capacity planning. So for example, this box that I have drawn, I could start putting in information regarding the number of devices I expect to see. So let's say 300 devices 
and uh, the, the, the member the attendees on this webinar who have been involved with Wi-Fi projects are I imagine now thinking to themselves well devices Nick that's a little bit vague what do you mean by devices we can we can we can use these generic device profiles what's important in here is the radio capabilities so it's a one by one device or a two by two you can create your own custom devices as well as define their usage profile and this is all about simulating airtime utilization so we're going to say that there's 150 laptops and they're all demanding four megabits per second consistently and there are also 150 smartphones and they're all demanding two megabits per second those devices are spread out evenly throughout this area and now we can change my visualization and have a look at airtime utilization this will simulate what would happen if there were those devices spread out evenly throughout this region with these APs. And the reason that we have some problems here is that these cells, there's, there's a capacity problem. There are, there are too many clients and the, the clients are too far away from the APs uh, to actually meet, to meet, the, uh, to meet good capacity requirements in these regions but you can see that there are three APs there where things look good if I hover the mouse we then get a pop out and a breakdown of the simulated airtime utilization in these areas finally what I'm going to do is run the auto planner this is where we say to Ekahau all right make some suggestions on where I should be putting these APs you need to configure things such as the AP height, which channels we're prepared to be using, what the minimum data rate is going to be, how many SSIDs Etc. Etc. The more data you can put in, the better the results that you will get out. And this is just to demonstrate if we said to work out, oh well, look, well, these are the areas that we've got. Um, how many APs do you think we should use? And then Ekahau will come up with a design for us, which I would probably augment. I would actually get involved here and and because I've I want to tweak the design, I want to manipulate these APs. Ekahau doesn't understand, for example, that this room here may not be suitable for, AP in, for an AP install. This is just looking at things from an, a pure RF point of view. Where would you put the APs if you want to meet your requirements? And here you go. These AP locations would serve your RF requirements perfectly. But I'm going to manipulate this design a little bit and I would move the APs around. OK, that is it for simulation. Um, just to remember also that we can simulate the directional APs, you can change the antennas, you can change the angle of tilt, you can change the angle of orientation, and uh, we can also do multi-floor simulations. So where we have, uh, say, two or three floors, and then you place an AP on the middle floor, we can simulate what, how much signal penetration there is between these floors. And that has a huge impact on our co-channel interference and therefore the channel selection. Now let's talk about survey for seven minutes. Do I want to save my changes? No, I don't. <clears throat> I've got Sidekick plugged in. So we'll bring in a new floor plan. Actually, we're going to bring in a, I'll bring in that one again. And so let's have a look at the live data that the Sidekick is receiving. So this bar along the bottom of the screen is called the real time frequency monitor. And if I pop that up to half a screen, You'll see in the middle there is now. I'm not sure how quickly this is going to update on your screens, but Sidekick, the Spectrum Analyzer, sweeps through both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands 20 times per second, with a resolution of 39 kilohertz. And what we are viewing right now in the middle in the middle of the screen is raw RF energy, and on the right hand side we're viewing the Wi-Fi data. So you can now see all of the APs that are surrounding me right now. I can pop this out into a standalone window. And we can also toggle over to the five gig band. And there we go. I wonder, what, wonder which AP I am associated to. So if we go to radios, for example, you can see in here that I am associated to this AP. So, I'm associated to that one there. And from a from an RF energy perspective, you can see that the five gigahertz band is actually very quiet. There's very little activity except for this AP, which is being not hammered, but heavily used. And that's because I'm on it and I'm doing a webinar. 
Uh, the blue line is the energy being received right now, and the color scheme up here is a representation of spectrum utilization. And if I was doing, if I were doing a Wi-Fi survey of this environment, I would be looking for devices that are highly utilizing the uh, spectrum, and that might interfere with my Wi-Fi communications. So this is how we look at the data live. We, if I wanted to do survey, again, we would need to bring that floor plan in and you still need to set the scale. So we come along to that scale tool, click and drag a known distance. This corridor is 29 meters in length. But now to collect survey data, I'd hop, I'd hop over to the survey tab. And then there are two types of survey that we can do. There is a stop and go survey and continuous. With stop and go, everything's nice and simple. We find ourselves on the map, so I would be physically on site right now, and I've gone into this room. I stand in the corner. I've got the sidekick on my shoulder, plugged into the laptop with the USB cable, and I click on the map where I'm stood, and then I stand still for five seconds. And what the sidekick does and what Echo does is it collects the, all of the Wi-Fi data that we can, and it stamps that onto the map in that location. So we would walk to the corners of the room, and then we come over here. And these are, I'm just doing left clicks here, nothing, nothing fancy. Maybe I would leave the room, add another data point just outside. And then when you have finished collecting data, you do a right click, and then some of the data that we have captured will be visualized for us if we hop over to the signal strength visualization. Now, the data that we're looking at here, not very reliable because the video cam's running, you saw I didn't move around, so this is not accurate. But now, if I bring that panel back on the left-hand side, you will see all of the detected APs. So right now, surrounding me, there are 42 APs. And we can see these are the APs that uh, make up the infrastructure, the wireless line infrastructure that I am associated to. But there are lots of APs in my environment, which I am, have nothing to do with me. For example, these APs uh, on 80 megahertz, these ones here, that's not so, so good. Uh, the other method of collecting data, survey data is a continuous survey. And we do this by doing a mouse click on the map where we are stood. And then we walk in a straight line at a constant speed. And you click on the map whenever you change speed or direction. So let's imagine I'm walking down this corridor. I'm walking at a constant speed. I get to this door. I click on the map. I then struggle with the door, walk through the door, close it behind myself, click on the map. Might zoom in a little bit to make this easier. And then I would walk around this office space, clicking on the map every time I change speed or direction. Now, if uh, anybody on the call here has performed a Wi-Fi survey, you will know that the people on site may not have been warned that a Wi-Fi surveyor was going to visit them today. And you will get some odd looks and people will ask you questions such as, who are you? What are you doing? Are you hunting for Pokemon? And if they do do that, I recommend you tell them, yes, yes, I am. I am hunting for Pokemon. Or if you have time, then by all means, explain to them that, no, you're here to do a Wi-Fi survey and it's nothing to worry about, but uh, I might come back and disturb you again in a moment. And, and I get it. I do understand uh, if you're working in an office and you're not expecting somebody with a laptop to walk into your room and wander around clicking on their laptop in each corner of the room it's understandable that they will have some questions for you. So I finished my survey now, I do a right click, make my excuses to the people that I've disturbed in this office, say, sorry guys, it was a fail, did not manage to capture the Pokemon in this room, and then you can leave and start making your way back. That starts to give you an idea of how we can simulate Wi-Fi and how we can survey Wi-Fi, collect that data, and then turn that into visualizations. And then finally, just want to show you what a Wi-Fi report document would look like. Um, you have a few options inside Ekahal on how to get that data out of the project file, but um, probably the most uh, 
the speediest one to discuss would be the one-click report. And the one-click report uses a fairly vanilla, it uses a generic, uh, generic template that we have created, uh, and that would produce a document that looks somewhat like this. And so hopefully this gives you just a feel that with very few mouse clicks, I can produce a Word document or a PDF document for that matter that contains all of the various visualizations from my simulation project or my survey project. And we can turn that into a Word document and that can then be handed over to, to a stakeholder, the, the end customer. So there's that visualization of network health. So a pass and fail view of this network. And uh, this project file here, you can see the survey path that the surveyor walked. Depending on how strict we are, we might talk to the surveyor and say, what happened to these rooms? Why, why did you not survey them? So that's why sometimes having the survey paths on is a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where you fit into that chain. Uh, and then as we come on down, just to show you that you can do things such as take pictures of your APs and have them included in the project so you can see here there are three APs and then here are my pictures that were taken on site I've also made some notes about those APs you know what what AP uh, the AP model uh, actually I didn't I didn't write down the AP model I literally just wrote AP model but uh, you can see the type of antenna that's involved the mounting of the AP the height etc etc uh, you can make picture notes and text notes and snapshots of the spectrum. So really the reports are a way of getting all of that data out, out of an Ekahal project file and into a format that anybody can open. All right, I am done for now. Let's answer a few questions and um, Think about wrapping things up but i don't want i want to be i don't want to keep anybody on the call for too long so that's the bulk of what i wanted to show you today um but i'm happy to stick around on the call a little bit a uh, little bit past the top of the hour uh, to answer questions uh, if uh, if required perfect thanks very much nick um real whistle stop tour there we've had lots of questions unfortunately we're probably not going to have time to answer all of them um we'll do a, a few now and then um for people that are interested they can stick around and listen to the rest so first of all um when you're doing a survey two usb dongles over one are you meant to use two um best practice i would use two it means that i can collect the data more quickly it, at a uh, at a crude level it means i can walk faster i need to worry less about walking at a very slow pace uh we dwell on each each channel for 105 milliseconds and there are 13 or maybe 14 channels in 2.4 and then another 12 or 13 channels in uh all right no 24 channels in total i'm going to try and scan 24 channels so in, in total, uh, it, it's about five seconds. So you want to be collecting data uh, as rapidly as possible. Can you do a survey with one external Wi-Fi dongle? Yes, you can. Uh, would you get more data and therefore potentially more accurate data with two dongles? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, do, does Mac now support the sidekick and dongles, etc.? So the Ekahal for Mac has been available in beta for, I think now for two years, two and a half years. Uh, for a long time, the Ekahal for Mac worked for opening existing project files and simulation. At the launch of Sidekick, Ekahal for Mac came out of beta and is now a fully functional product. The only limitation is that if you want to do a survey on Mac OS, you've got to have a Sidekick. Fundamental reasoning for this is that Mac OS, there is no easy way to add an external Wi-Fi dongle to the operating system. And so that's part and parcel of what Sidekick resolves is that Sidekick is a self-contained unit. Uh, it's not being driven by Mac OS and therefore we get around that. So the answer to the question is yes. As of Sidekick launch, Ekahal, the solution, works equally well on Mac and Windows. In fact, it works identically on Windows and Mac. Perfect, thanks very much. Um, we'll come to the rest of the questions very shortly. Okay. Um, there's just a couple more slides to 
finish off to next steps. So, uh, as we said, this was a whistle stop tour. If you'd like to see more about what ECAO can do, by all means, please contact us or contact uh, Nick directly if you wish to arrange a one-on-one -on -one demo. This can be completely tailored to exactly what you want to see. Um, and we can obviously go into a lot more depth about the particular areas of ECAO. Um, also, live webinars. So ECAO do a webinar um, series, or they've been doing a couple of webinar series. Um, they're excellent. There's a lot of technical content into them. Please go to ECAO.com um, and make sure you subscribe to some of those. There's a, there's a whole range of topics from Wi-Fi security to design and all sorts of things. There's also a load of free training materials available as well on ecohow.com. Um, there's infographics, there's white papers, you name it, it's there and it's all free. There is also um, some quick start training uh, available online for ecohow customers. It's a three hour deep dive into exactly how the product tools work. Um, so at the point that you purchase ecohow, you're not just left to get on with it. There's lots and lots of help and resources available. We also do a one day intensive hands on product training course if you want something which is classroom based. Uh, we've got a great trainer called Phil. Uh, we do the courses at the Open Reality HQ here in Abingdon. Um, we've actually got a course coming up at the end of the month in the 24th of October. I believe there are still some spaces available on it. Um, so if you're thinking of, of buying Ekahau or you've just bought Ekahau and you'd like to learn more about how to use it, then please get in touch. We can give you the details about that course. You can also um, become an ECAO certified survey engineer. We've uh, we've got some fantastic trainers um, from the from the ECAO team. They do courses all over the world. Um, we hold the courses in the UK and Oxford. Uh, we can also do on-site courses as well. Um, we do have one course uh, in on the 18th to the 21st of December. That's the last course of 2018. Spaces are limited, so if you do want to get um, ECAO certified. Uh, this year then you need to get your skates on. We do have some some course dates in 2019 which we'll be announcing very soon as well. And finally if obviously contact us for, for pricing, um, product information or to, to book a demo, the, uh, the, the telephone number and the email address of the wireless team is on there. Um, also you can you can reach out to ECAO directly um, or one of our one of our reseller partners in the UK as well and they'd be happy to help. So with all that said and done there are a couple more questions um, that we'll cover off if you're right to stick around for a little bit Nick. Absolutely yes. Perfect. And thank you everybody for joining the call. Uh, hope, hope, hope what we've covered so far was uh, informative uh, and, and useful and um, if you need to jump off the call now please do so uh, but if you wish to stick around a tiny bit longer i'll see me see if i can answer uh, any of those outstanding questions perfect what i'll do is i'll pass presentation back to you nick you might be you okay. need to show things within the software absolutely um, okay so there was quite a lot of questions about um the capacity requirements of areas on the floor plan so whether you could just okay. have a couple, couple more minutes to show how you configure um, types of devices um, and mm. the device requirements within um, particular areas of, of the map um, and also a question about how many capacity areas can you actually set? Hmm. I don't know what the limit is. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's a hard limit. <laughs> what, 1,024 1, maybe? Uh, <laughs> Although by that point, the map might be so covered in little dots that you won't be able to see anything. Uh, let me hide the go to webinar screen here. Uh, and let's switch the visualization off for a moment. So, and we can go into view and switch the walls off. So there's that floor plan again, and you can see that we've got a few APs. So uh, this area here, the, the primary area I can go into and say, I imagine there are going to be 100 devices in this area, and there are going to be 50 devices that are 802.11 AC capable, and 50, uh, well, actually, these ones are 802.11 AC as well, uh, but they're 3x3x3 three by three by three or 2x2x2. Two by two by two. Now, I said that you could create your own custom devices. You absolutely can. So let's add another 50, and this time we're going to configure profiles, and we can create a new one in here, and we'll call this 
uh, iPhone 5. Uh, and the iPhone 5, I uh, really shouldn't do this without checking my facts, but I'm pretty sure the iPhone 5 could do 5 gigahertz and it was 802.11n uh, and it was a 2x2 two two device, probably 20 megahertz wide channel width. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, let's say Nick's imaginary. Imaginary. Yeah, that looks right. Good. Uh, so I think I can use Nick's imaginary iPhone 5 here. And um, you see, what, what matters about these device profiles is the standard of Wi Fi that they support the spatial stream capabilities and the max channel width that's really all that matters for simulating air simulating airtime inside ecohelm and we could call this this main area and, and, and the thing to remember here is that those 150 devices are now spread out evenly throughout area one i can now go back to the planning tools and start a new area I think the only limitation in here is that you can't have an area that crosses a boundary. So I can do this, but I can't do this. That's probably the only limitation, really. Uh, so what I've done now is I've created area two. And what you should know is that these areas are exclusive. So by drawing area two, area one actually has now become more dense. So those 150 devices that I plopped into area one, as soon as I drew area two, they were all pushed out of that. So now we have 150 devices spread out evenly throughout area one and area two is empty. If we go into area two, I can now say, well, we're gonna see actually 200 devices in that area. And then we could drop an AP into that area does that answer your question uh poor show i don't know what the max limit for the areas are uh i'm sure there is a limit but i've not i've not come across it yet uh, that's i think that answers the question very nicely thank you very much for that nick um so question here about once you set the scale is there any sort of um ruler tool measurement tool can you mm -hmm. can you then see how far away things are for sort of cabling Absolutely. yeah 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 well ooh, for cabling even better so uh the the scale tool the one that i used to set the initial scale that is both the scaling tool and the ruler tool so you can and you can also reset the scale whenever you like so this corridor i said it was 29 meters at first but let's imagine that actually i got it wrong and it was 27 meters so you can see here that the scale is currently at 29 meters but i can just change it by going 27 press return and now the scale of my map has changed and that that scale tool can then just be used to measure distances as well. I recommend you click on the, if you're gonna try and measure a horizontal distance, click on the right hand side first, because then you're not fighting with the little pop-up. So you can measure that. And you only need to set the scale in one dimension and then or one axis, and then we'll see both have now been scaled. As for cabling, you we do actually have a feature in the notes tool uh, for text notes, that's where you drop a pin on the map and you can write text, a picture note where you drop a pin on the map and you can add uh, a picture. Or we do have cable notes and cable notes are a way of sort of marking uh, with a dashed line the, the, the route that you propose that cable should run. And then based upon the scale of the map, you can see that we're getting a little ticker uh, adding up down there and that's giving you a feel for what the horizontal distance is. Of course, it's not taking into account the rise and drop of that cable run. So we may run that into here where the cab is. And then we would say, this is going to AP5. And then we could start running the cable for this. Well, actually this cable, this AP, we might be able to 
punch it over that wall there and get into the oh there. So absolutely, there is a tool in in there is a tool available for making cable notes, and then they would be available in the report document uh, in a table. Fantastic. Okay, I'm um, just having a quick look for some extra questions. Okay. Um, there's, there's one here. It says the. Um, Does the survey, uh, so the survey creates a heat map of the current wireless network in place. Can it also be used to collect data that will enable you to design and understand how many APs will be required in that particular environment? Okay, that's a, that is an interesting question. And the, the answer is no, no. The, the Echo How doesn't have the ability to collect environmental data during a survey and then use that information to create virtual walls for a simulation project. That sort of feature does not exist at present. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out at some point in the future, but certainly not at the moment. Uh, no, you are either doing a survey project where you're collecting data or you do a simulation where it's virtual now the the closest i think we come to that at the moment is the hybrid design approach or where we do a little bit of simulation and we do ap on a stick now in the uk i have observed that we like to do ap on a stick survey a lot uh, in the us and europe uh, yeah, maybe a little bit more in the Europe, but in the US, a simulation is is far more common. So you would get the floor plans and you produce a design based on a simulation, install the equipment, then do a validation survey. But from my experience in the UK, lots of AP on a stick, and therefore, uh, I think there's a I think there's a happy medium in the middle that maybe if you've got the opportunity to go on site and take some measurements then you could do an AP on a stick survey for say five AP locations, take that project away. Uh, on Windows, it's nice and easy to open two Echo windows. You can do it on Mac as well. You just got to duplicate the application uh, and then you can have two Echo windows open and then you could actually tailor a simulation project with a virtual wall to match the results that you captured during an on-site piece of survey work. So automatically, no, there's no way to take survey data and turn it into wall information for a simulation project. But if you were clever about it, you could do a hybrid approach and do essentially that. Great. Um, question here. I think I already know the answer to this. Which is better, stop and go or continuous survey? Ooh. Well, uh, I depends. think this might be a. <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. It's the 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 ever the ever suitable answer of it depends. Uh, I prefer continuous because I collect more data with fewer mouse clicks, and I can walk in a straight line, and I'm collecting data all the time. But there are scenarios, maybe public spaces or education environments. I know I've tried to survey classrooms whilst a class is being taught, and that's it's far less distracting if you do it with stop and go, because then you're not wandering around the, the classroom holding your laptop, trying to walk in straight lines. So, and you can mix the two data types. There's no reason to stick with just one for your project. You can do a mixture of continuous and stop and go. Uh, they're equally good. They are both methods of assigning Wi-Fi data to an XY coordinate on your map. And that's all we're trying to do here is tell the software, this information applies to this area. This information now applies to this area. So personally, I prefer continuous, but I have also used stop and go. Thank you very much, Nick. Um... I've got two questions here. I'm not. I think the second one might be something uh, more suitable for the ECAL support team because it says um, I've, the, my report from ECAL doesn't show anything um, in the interference section. Is that a software issue? Uh, no, I can touch on that very quickly. Uh, when, when, when the visualization 
is the, the interference visualization. Where is it? Interference slash noise. This is showing you what the noise floor reported by your NIC was during a survey. So uh, I'm not going to go into great detail right now on this, but I'd be happy to talk to you on a one-to-one -one session on this, or feel free to drop out, drop an email to support. But basically, the interference noise view shows you what the noise floor was from the NIC during your survey. And there, uh, it, it means that areas where the NIC detected a high noise floor will be shown. So if you're not seeing anything, it means that the NIC didn't report a noise floor greater than the threshold during your survey. If we open up this project here and we will see that the interference noise visualization at neg 80 probably won't show that much. This is a survey project. So let's switch this off, switch off the survey paths. We can even switch off the APs. But yeah, you see, I've got the same thing here. And that just means that during my survey, the NIC did not report a noise floor greater than neg 90 in these areas. Now, that does, does that mean that there's no other interference on site? No, it doesn't. Uh, that's where the spectrum analyzer comes in. So interference noise is all about the noise floor as reported by your NIC. Spectrum analysis, different story. And that's when we are looking at what's the energy, what's the spectrum utilization look like? Are there areas where there are strong sources of, of energy in either the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz bands, the bands that we care about for Wi-Fi? So that's, that's what's happening there with your uh, interference slash noise visualization. Okay, great. Um, I think in the interest of time, we've already gone 15 minutes over. We'll, we'll end it there for today. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for your questions and your time. Thank you um, very much, Nick, for a great demo and for answering all those questions. Um, as we said earlier, if you've if you've got more questions or you'd like to see more, then, uh, then please just get in touch and we can uh, arrange a one-on-one -on -one session with you. Perfect. Sam, thank you very much for the opportunity to present uh, with you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending the call. Uh, very much appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.